today I'm going to talk to you about some business tips. Now you might be thinking, but you don't have a business, but I have had many businesses in my time and handmade ones in that. So today I thought I would give you some tips because I have learned a lot of things that I wish I had have known before I started any of these. Call me naive at the start of it, but I'm hoping if you guys are thinking about starting a handmade business, then these things that I learned will help you. So like so many of us, I started my handmade businesses because somebody or many people said to me, oh my gosh, you should start selling these things. And as flattering as it is for people to say that, sometimes you do get caught up in that and you think that everyone's going to want your product. The reality is not everyone's going to want your product and that's just, yeah. That just is what it is. I thought I would give you guys some of my wisdom. If you don't know, I have had my own handmade businesses back in the past. I've done uh, artificial floristry and then I've also done scrunchies as a full business. My artificial flowers or floristry was probably my biggest learning curve in a way. Artificial floristry grew over time. I had it for about five years. I did it as more of a side hustle. I had a, a part-time job and then I did that as well. And basically what happened was I started off making bits and pieces. I made hoops with florals all over it, flower crowns, arrangements, things like that. And I made them pre-made and then would sell them at markets. The problem with that was at that time, it was right just before the real artificial flowers really started to come to life. So basically I was ahead of time, but then at the same time, I didn't have the, the knowledge back then to understand what I needed to do to sustain it, to keep it going so that once I was fully on trend that it would keep going. I know this sounds a little bit weird, but basically what I'm saying is right as the peak hit and my business was about to boom, I actually closed my business and I, I regret it, but the reasons behind it were basically because I didn't have the tools in my tool belt to continue. Then I started the scrunchie business and then the scrunchie business, that was right when scrunchies came in. So it was kind of right where the market kind of got a little bit saturated. I think that's why I struggled more with that one. So basically what happened with the artificial floristry was I did the markets. There seemed to be a bit of a market for weddings. And I actually had my wedding in amongst all of this and created my own bouquet and a few other wedding decorations, all with artificial flowers. Back then, my supplier that I used had flowers from really top quality to not so great quality. So I was working with a range of different flowers. That was great because I learned what I needed to know for the future. But yeah, I really enjoyed it, but I just, I literally made my last bouquet and I said, nah, that's it, I'm done. It was a big financial outlay, um, outlay for each wedding. Um, and that was a huge factor. It was also hugely like it took up a lot of space. It took up a lot of space, but at the same time, like sewing takes up a lot of space as well. So, and I was trying to kind of do the two things at once. That kind of just didn't work. So it was kind of like what what could give. And now in hindsight, I think I wish I had have just kept going with the artificial flowers over the scrunchies. But again, hindsight's a beautiful place to live. My biggest piece of advice would be starting as tiny, tiny, tiny as possible. So starting with like one or two products that you can evolve from is your best part, to, is the best place to start. Don't overextend yourself, don't over, especially with money wise, you know, just start really small. Like make only a handful of things, sell them. Once you've got, sold all of those or you're down to the last one, then go buy more. This 
goes kind of hand in hand with creating a bit of suspense you know making people wait sometimes isn't a bad thing while you want to grab onto people while they're willing to spend money you and you know you want to kind of jump on board with the impulse buyers sometimes that's not actually the long-term goal and good for the long-term goal impulse buyers usually don't in turn make you the return buyers so what you want to create is something that you are going to get people people to rebuy or buy more of or say to other people you need to buy this so it's those reoccurring buys now having said that for me the wedding game isn't really that because most people don't get married twice <laughs> you know like especially in a short amount of time so you don't want to do that but at the same time creating suspense is is kind of where you want to be you want to be in that sweet spot of building suspense but also giving to your customers so in turn with that is the overcommitment. Do not overcommit yourself. You are much better off being able to say a three week wait. Say on a bouquet, I had a three week wait and then I actually got it done in like two or like one and a half to two weeks. How much better would you feel if I turned around to you saying, oh, it's ready and they were, wa they were willing to wait the three weeks. They are going to be a much happier customer than if I was to turn around and say, oh yeah, it's only gonna take me one and a half weeks, but then at one and a half weeks saying, sorry, it's still not ready. So that is a massive one I learned. Knowing your worth as well is a huge one. Know your time is worth the money. It, you might be able to start slightly less at the start, but don't cut yourself short from the start either because people are willing to spend money. You've just gotta find your market. Oh, the big one. This, I got this all the time. And again, like I say, this, while it was flattering, it wasn't helpful. People said to, my friends and family would say to me all the time, oh, you should sell that. I had made something for myself. Now, you should sell that. So then I would be like, oh, oh, okay, I've got to make it. I've got to make it. Okay. So then I would like run around trying to make things. I would buy all these products and, you know, make all these things and then they wouldn't sell and then I would be left disappointed I would be left with all of these products and it wasn't what my market wanted or right, again with the starting small I didn't do a website for my artificial flowers but I did have a website for my scrunchies and boy was that a big mistake I had only been in the business for a about a year I hadn't fully understood the market behind scrunchies so for me I saw all these people having all of these all of these websites and everything and you know they looked like they were making heaps of money no it's not that easy having your own website means you have to have your own customer base to drive them to those websites or to that particular website well when you're very green and very new and have a very small customer base it's not sustainable I was paying around $40 Australian a month for my my website and I was not making that at all I was doing better at my markets at my physical markets than I was on my online my advice to you guys is start off small and start on somewhere like Etsy Etsy have huge commission base, I know, but at the same time, you're going to pay a lot less in these commissions than you are if you were to try and have your own website and then drive your own client base. They have the client base already. To me now, that's a no-brainer. There are so many other websites out there though that are like Etsy. It's just that Etsy has, it's like eBay. eBay has the market already and there are other versions of eBay basically. Even selling on eBay is an option sometimes. Something else I also did was put my flower crowns in a shop and that was all commission based and a monthly fee. Only about $25 a month, which isn't too bad. But when you're paying that 
and you're also having the website because at that time I was simul simultaneously having the flowers and the scrunchies. Not the best idea. And then the commission, I think the commission rate was about 15%. It was pretty high, really. Having said that, the pricing on those things were a lot more. Scrunchies, the most I sold a scrunchie for was $8. That it's quite a premium price really for a scrunchie as well but I used premium products so or well, premium fabric for that one so while having the physical aspect is great especially for something like the scrunchies that I knew that I did better at market the outlay was not worth it I was better off just going to a market the other thing is to use your networks use your people and I don't mean it as in like in a bad way using your people, but use your family and friends to test out products. If they have shops themselves, ask them if you could pop just a few little things in their front window. My hairdresser was so kind to me and let me have my scrunchies in her shop and that was a huge deal for me. I don't think she'll ever understand how much I appreciated that. I also use my friends to test workshops out because I was like, oh, workshops would be great. And while I thought they were gonna be great, they were a lot harder than I expected. So having my friends come around and me test me talking and how I explained things and the setup and all of that sort of thing, all right, a little bit about branding. So your thing you need to know is your community. And I say community instead of competition because I am not about competition. There are so many beautiful, amazing women and men out there creating some incredible things and they are not your competition. Your work, you are worth something just as much as they are. They who you are looking at are probably a lot more years in advance to what you are right now looking at starting a business. So you too can get to that point. So you might see somebody's branding and you might really like it, but please do not copy. You are taking inspiration from that person. For me, I really enjoyed, well, I love pink. Pink is my favorite color. So for me, I really, I looked for other people's pinks. It wasn't always in, so for my scrunchie logo, I wanted a pink background with the words, that's the scrunchie girl on it. I knew I wanted it in a circle as well because I knew that I was going to be branding it on Instagram and at the time circles were really in and they still kind of really are so that was a new sort of what I wanted. I didn't necessarily look at all of the other scrunchie businesses I looked at other handmade businesses and I looked for the pinks that I liked, what I didn't like, what worked for me, what didn't work for me, what stood out to me, what didn't, all those sorts of things. So I looked for those things. And like I said, it wasn't always just scrunchy businesses. It was other handmade businesses. Instagram is a fabulous place to be discovered, but it's hard. Instagram, and you've probably heard multiple times the saying Instagram worthy or Insta versus reality as well. What I like to look at is what I wanted to create. So I knew that having that consist, and you hear this all the time, a consistency with your photos. Instagram is like a magazine. I treat it like a magazine. So, you know, when you first look at it, you're like, oh, that's really beautiful. The whole thing, you don't really see one particular thing. It kind of, you see it all as one, if that makes sense. So if you go have a look on my current Instagram for brunchy girls, you will see that I always have a filter online. For people that have products, that's not necessarily what you initially think that you wanna do. Cause you wanna, especially if you've got things like scrunchies that you wanna show off their color, their true color. That doesn't always look great when you've got lots of different colors and it just, sometimes that's not the way you wanna go. What I say to people 
is your Instagram is like a catalog or like a magazine. And then your act, if you have like an Etsy or a website, that's where you show you the true colors. And I don't mean it as in like you're showing your true colors. It's just that you show your actual, you try and get it as right as possible. And that is so impossible. It's, it's, yeah, it's really hard. So you're always going to disappoint probably somebody. You can use consistent backgrounds. So you might, for me, I really like, I really like my table, my wooden tabletop. And I have a, like a mat thing. You know what are they called? Placemats. And I generally have that if I have a flat lay, that's usually where I go for my photos. Or I love to have it in my backyard because I love all my flowers and things like that. Or I like to be out in nature somehow. That's kind of my consistency for background. If you're doing products, then you might want to have a white background in all your photos. You might want to have different colors, but having you know, all pastel colors in the background. So you can have all different colors, but all pastels or all brights, just depends on your brand really. You might wanna have a black background. Investing in good product photos is definitely key, depending on what sort of level you're at at the moment. If you're only just starting out, don't stress too much, but as you do progress, you will want to invest a bit more time, maybe a little bit more equipment for getting really good high quality photos. The quality of the photo on Instagram doesn't really matter, but it's things like your thank you cards and things like that, that you are going to want good quality for. While we're on the Instagram and photos, let's talk about ambassadors and brand reps. So this is a really big trending thing that's happening at the moment. It's a great trend, but it can be a bit harmful to your business as well. You want to make sure that at the very start, perhaps using just one ambassador might help your business, but not investing too much money with them. The ambassador programs are great in terms of it does create business for you, but you want to make sure that you're getting something else back from that as well. And you need to make sure you have clear guidelines around what you're expecting from them and keeping in touch with them regularly and making sure that they're aware of these terms and conditions constantly is definitely a big one. Stating from the start what kinds of backgrounds you're expecting from them, uncluttered photos, up close, far away, um, outdoor, indoor, all your terms and conditions, what you are wanting to look, want, what you are wanting to build your brand to look like is what you need to make sure they are doing. It's as simple as that because they are working for you. Even though you may feel like they're doing you a massive favor, they are working for it as well. And that's how you need to treat it. And that's how they should be treating it as well. All right, let's talk about some pricings and things like that. Good old wholesale. Now with my scrunchies, I started doing wholesale. My florist street, no, because that was all commission based. Or not commission based, I shouldn't say that. It was all like to order. So with my scrunchies, I started doing wholesale. Basically, the formula is double how much it costs you plus labor, and then you have your wholesale. And then you double that again, and you've got your retail price. So for me, a scrunchie used to cost around, I think it was $1.50. Basically, didn't make anything on my labor because then I would sell them for a dollar fifty, sorry, I would sell them for about $3, depending on what one. So I had $5 scrunchies and I had $8 scrunchies. So my $5 scrunchies, I used to sell wholesale for only $3. And then my $8 ones, I used to sell for $5 per scrunchie it was enough to cover everything because I made sure it did but yeah it wasn't I wasn't making a heck of a lot of money where I made my money was at the markets because I didn't I still had them at retail price which was the same as at the salons that were buying wholesale but like the wholesale price was in there so I was making more money postage is a big one as well very very confusing and I learned a lot I didn't ever post any of my artificial floristry stuff, but I did post the scrunchies and man, was that hard work to work out what was the best value. I now know a few little tips and tricks and I will put up some pricing that's probably out of date now, but this was basically how I worked out 
whether or not I was going to be paying a ten dollar parcel. No one wants to pay ten dollars postage for an eight or five dollar scrunchie. So you have to make it worthwhile for them because otherwise no one's gonna buy them. I nearly went down Oh no, actually I did go down this aisle. So another trend that was happening with scrunchies was hair clips. So I invested in buying some hair clips. Then I was like, oh, what about hair scarves and things like that? I have so many hair scarves now. Anyone want to buy them? Because I can't get rid of them. I can't give them away basically. So that was a big mistake, but my clips did pretty well. Um, I sold them for double the price of what I paid for them. All right, so also with Instagram, follow like-minded accounts. So what that means is like I was saying, I looked at other handmade companies, not just scrunchy companies. And I that's where I got my inspiration and my clientele from as well. So Instagram works by the more sort of crafty things that you follow, the more crafty people are gonna find your stuff basically I highly do not recommend just following going on someone's Instagram and just following a bunch of bunch of random people it will get you nowhere you might get a follow for a follow but honestly it really gets you nowhere you want to create true connections with people that's what's going to get you somewhere when I used to go to markets as well especially with my artificial floristry stuff I would keep a discounted price in mind so I knew roughly where I could go down to for if somebody came and if they if they asked me for a discount and I felt like they deserved it because at the end of the day my it's my product and I get to choose. So if I felt they deserved it, then I would. If I was finding that the market was starting to slow down, I might slash a few prices or if people were sort of on the edge, do I, don't I, it might have been that tipping point that would actually get people to actually purchase. Also having a discount returning customers, I found was really handy. All right, so that's basically it. That is, they are some serious lessons that I learned over the time and I hope you guys have learned something today and I hope I didn't waffle on too much. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will chat to you guys next time. Bye. Hey.